Okay, and uh, we continue with a perspective from a performer, a piano player, uh, Matthias Bazaras, with his presentation, Rethinking Habits of Practicing Through Nikolas Nimsky, Tesaurus of Scales and Melodic Patterns, and Jerry Bergonzi, Insight Improvisation Series. Please, welcome. May I start now? Uh, hello, my name is Motives, uh, and uh, my presentation will be uh, the outlook of a performer, not a composer. But uh, I think that for performers, uh, this is really good to know more deep what the composing pro process is or how the music is created and uh, at first I would like to, to start with some elementary things like uh, audition and classical music. Uh, by the way, I'm a pianist and I, I will speak uh, also in the name of a pianist and also as a, as a piano teacher uh, what I also notice in, in my students uh, what habits they bring and uh, is it good or is it bad and how to fix it? But uh, in classical music, I mean the, the classical until the 20th century music, uh, maybe I'm, I will be not exact in terms and the modern music for me is maybe not the 21st century or new con concepts of, of, of sounding, but maybe for some contemporary composers, this is also classical music of the 20th century. But uh, with all their music, uh, pianists also have a lot of measures how to improve their uh, audiation process through the scales, uh, quite easy harmonic language, and uh, this process should be like in the balance of learning repertoire and also improving your uh, audiation. Uh, acquirements, but uh, and also we we should analyze. But what happens because it doesn't work as as it should uh, because uh, there are a couple of things. What I'll, also what I noticed as a teacher that uh, uh, this is a big time gap between how we learn pieces and what pieces we learn. And when all this theoretical material in the subjects like harmony, solfeggio, rhythmical training uh, comes in the uh, learning process. And we always start earlier to play more complex pieces, then we uh, con consciously uh, know how, for, for, for what elements is, is this consistent. And uh, it's, it sounds funny, but it's like we can sight read music, but we cannot analyze it. And this is what I what I always see in the students. And there's a lot of uh, examples, like you know, for 14 years old, uh, playing uh, some Liszt, Chopin, or Debussy, maybe Prokofiev, and uh, even some Mozart sonata, and when you s just stop the performance and say just play from the certain place in the text, so this is like uh, the process of a lottery. They're trying to bang any note, so there is no relation of the harmony uh, comprehension and what they are playing. They can play through the, all the text, but if you will stop them, you will have a problem. Also, this is also related with our uh, stage performance, uh, the uh, stops, stops or some tragedies during the performances in, 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 in concerts and competitions. Of course, it can happen for everybody. You can know good, but uh, so this is not a rule, but it can help. And then we have uh, another problem uh, when we face to much more modern music. Uh, let's let's say uh, of the 20th century, and uh, 
there we have some 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 much much bigger problems. Like the, the major problem is that this atonal textures uh, is a feeling like a chaos for for most of performance, and we have really little knowledge, and we we cannot find some ground on on this. And and when I say that like. We know like what is the dominant seven, but uh, or we should know, but not always, as I have mentioned before. And so this is uh, the question: uh, what what to ground yourself uh, in? In what theory? Or and I was searching a lot, and of course the methods what I will speak today this is not a panacea for. Any, everything, but uh, what I have found, there's some some things what can help with some certain things like passages or some constructions, and uh, these uh, methods can help to have some theoretical vocabulary uh, and to help yourself to to more understand music or more to memorize music or to have uh, some logical ground, and there is some quite uh, interesting story about two persons in 20th century. One of them is Nicholas Slonimsky and his uh, uh, big edition of like, the Zaurus of uh, melodic patterns and intervals. And uh, the story is, is in, in this slide that uh, he wanted to, to do so something like a big vocabulary of all modes, what was consisted in, in, in the modern music. And uh, there was a lot, a lot of refusal from uh, editors or publishers to, to do this because uh, they said that uh, nobody needs this and uh, why are you doing this? Nobody will buy this, this, this kind of book. And uh, in the beginning it was like this. Uh, there was just one copy sold, and uh, Solonimsky himself he just uh, uh, forgot that he had this this uh, book, and uh, for few decades, for two decades, and uh, another person. Uh, if you have read this one, I would like to move on. Uh, is John Coltrane, uh, who. <laughs> Like discovered this book, and uh, he improved jazz music language a lot uh, just because of this book, and uh, and this is another quite funny thing that Coltrane himself he he considered that he's not playing jazz; he's playing music, and he said that jazz is like. A, the name from labels, but not 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 from me. And uh, so we have two persons, and this is quite a paradoxal situation. One person who hadn't any intentions to improve jazz music, and another jazz musician who said that I don't play jazz. And now I will do the third uh, paradoxal thing. I will use them not for jazz music Im 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 improvement also. And uh, also I will speak about uh, also Jerry Bergonzi, what was created just for jazz musicians to improve. So I will use it for not for jazz Im improvisation improvements. So I think we, we need to talk a, a little bit more about uh, how it works and uh, what was really interesting for me that uh, Mr. Slonimsky, he tried to erase any mentions of major and minor. Uh, to start from scratch, uh, we have like 12 tones or, or something, but we have a, a overall symmetry. Uh, we can uh, imagine this on the keyboard, maybe it's the, the best form for layout. But uh, he used some uh, Latin and uh, Greek words, how to recall the intervals. We have this like uh, semitone whole tone. It's okay. This is quite useful. But from the minor third, we have this sesquiton, then major third diton, perfect for data and so on. 
I think this was made intentionally, intentionally like to forget anything of major and minor relations, how, how to escape from this. And then we have a, like a subdivision of one octave in some symmetrical parts. And uh, this is an example of uh, Triton, uh, Triton uh, principal tones and how we can construct uh, new modes, so-called new modes. So we can interpolate some uh, notes, we can ultrapolate some notes, and we can uh, infrapolate some notes. And we have a lot of variations on this. We can use all three or two or one. And we have some really nice uh, progressions. And in this one, uh, I mean, in all the book, we can find uh, inco incorporated things like Messian modes because it, it really uh, fits on especially on, on this, uh, we have this like uh, detone principal uh, tones, and uh, this mode is is like uh, three uh, transposition modes of, of a messian. So it's just called in different way, but we can find a lot of things, and also we can uh, divide two octaves in three equal parts, three octaves in four equal parts, and so on and so on. And uh, this is almost, uh, you, you can do a lot of things. And then I tried to apply these principles not just for uh, warming up or uh, new, new kind of arpeggios, but tried to, to feel like, analyze some situations in the repertoire. And one of them, uh, the first one is, from Ludus Tonalis, interlude number eight, uh, there is some certain passages what we can analyze as like a quinquet on uh, ground tones. This is like a, a minor seven with some four uh, notes interpolation. And uh, when you try to memorize this and when you don't have any uh, theoretical ground, it's much more difficult. To, to memorize, but in, in this kind of uh, thinking, it's m much more easier because also you can you can try to transpose it or to continue the, the same line and and you you can see as a performer how how this is consistent and this is really uh, important thing. Also, the, the next. Uh, Example is the excerpt from the second movement of the Eighth Sonata of Prokofiev. Uh, this is not uh, some technical or passage thing, but this is quite a uh, nice sounding place. And also we can apply this like a palind palindromic can canon of the uh, Tessaron progression. It's like a perfect fourth going uh, in sequence. And, uh, and this is good to know for a performer. Uh, what is this material, or not just to play the notes without any explanation? And uh, of course, uh, this method is like for for dummies. Uh, this is not you know like big books you you must read, uh, but just to apply some principles, and this really eases our life. Uh, my personal life. I don't know if somebody used this. Uh, I should ask of pianists. And uh, the, the continuing uh, uh, Slonimsky ideas, uh, I was talking with Jerry Bergonzi and he said that the Slonimsky Tesaurus was the, one of the best influences for him to create this in, inside improvisation series. And uh, also for me, the Hexatonics was, was the first book when I started to think about how can I change my uh, you know, habits of playing, uh, analyzing music, and uh, so on. And uh, and I think the, the Slonim, that Slonimsky, Slonimsky was a, a teacher for, for Bergonzi in this way. And uh, these are really two interesting uh, th uh, books. And uh, 
the number five is thesaurus of intervallic melodies. This is some like construction of motifs that you can systemize and uh, construct al also new passages. And that was the, the purpose was for jazz musicians to uh, improve their vocabulary, maybe to, to do it not such uh, stereotypical and maybe to play out of harmony. But I found this also uh, as a measure to apply how to analyze some certain passages in, in music. And uh, I should explain, uh, these are three um, uh, parameters what, what we should set before we start. The first is the direction of the phrase, and uh, there's a lot of combination of three note phrase. Uh, for example, the A is all three notes uh, goes up, uh, then B two up, one down, and so on and so on. And we can do uh, in then uh, in four notes uh, progression also five if we want. We have uh, and you know this is much much more uh, variants what we can do. Uh, the, th the second thing is uh, the permutation of uh, these uh, like intervals which, which will go in some other uh, slide. It's like you can choose some intervals like uh, uh, minus two is like also the minor second, then we have the major second, we have the minor third and, and uh, major third. And Going back, you, you can have a lot of permutations how you will put all these uh, intervals. And the result is like we have s s something like a cipher or like a code F11 and uh, what it is if, if we start from the uh, sound C and we will have this combination so we'll have some, some phrase. And then we have a, and when then we can construct anything. This is like some uh, separated information, but uh, it also can work for us to have much more interesting thing to play to to improve our technique and also our uh, comprehen comprehensive uh, and also hearing process because. Uh, this sounds quite atonal, and uh, if we'll try to, to listen to intervals carefully and try to continue the line, uh, I think this is also a really useful thing to escape from from the you know this ground of, of, of tonality and uh, and maybe to discover something something new. And much more complex. And I also tried to apply this method to analyze some passages. This is excerpt from uh, Samuel Barber's sonata. And there is some place uh, which is we can count all twelve tones. But uh, this is this should be very good method to try to analyze all these uh, sixteen notes passage all the intervals and to try to find some similarities between one and another and maybe this could be a system of uh, how we can learn this so i i tried to to write down one phrase and 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 i found this is we have some repeating uh, direction form and also we have some repeating intervals and in this in this uh, case we i think also, we can do some variation on this, but because this is also uh, there's some repeating uh, thing in all the movement, the first movement we have this in exposition, and also we have this in the reprise. Uh, this is also useful to, to know from from what this consists. And also, I I tried to work out with the same place from Hindemith interlude. So this system also fits. Okay, we have all this five arrows down, so the direction is is always down. But also we have this, uh, some repeating intervals, some cycles of intervals. 
So we can try to systemize this. And now I would like to talk a little bit about the, the hexatonics. Uh, so this is uh, uh, also Bergonzi's method to to do some uh, six note modes, but uh, the principle to how to organize this, this is two triads. Uh, it can be major, minor, diminished or augmented. And uh, they, they can be uh, in some interval uh, apart. So we have these two major triads above C and D. And so we have this uh, six uh, six uh, notes mode, and another uh, example is uh, C and uh, F sharp, and so this this is how how this is constructed, and we have all the possible conf configurations how we can uh, manage this. And there's a lot of possibilities also to, to make a lot of uh, new figures and new passages. And also we can, we can play this like an exer exercises, uh, but it's much more complex because you always need to think about how to deal with these two triads and uh, to incorporate like in one mode. Uh, and uh, there are some examples what, what we can do with these figurations. Uh, it's like a patterns and this is countless. And you can also uh, think about yourself. You can compose and... and uh, I also tried to do some like 12 tone things uh, because uh, in 12 tone row we, we can incorporate four Triads, of course, it can be two minor and two major, for example. It can be, yes, so I, I just do did with this kind of combination and and you can just try to incorporate this in one and another and uh, have some really complex uh, passages and uh, maybe it, it looks uh, complex, but, but when you can analyze this, much more easier to understand. And also, uh, the last of my slide, uh, this is also excerpt from uh, Samuel Barber, uh, from the same place what I have shown. Uh, so the, the left hand is also, is consistent with, with the four augmented uh, triads and and this is also good to know and maybe it could be the, some theoretical ground for, for pianists to be more conscious what they're playing. So that's it from me and thank you for listening. <laughs>a, a guitar version of the Slaniminski that uh, that I bought. Um, um, I'm not sure who. I'm not sure if it was him, but so, somebody I can't remember now who who made a, gu a guitar version, and I found it very useful for various reasons, like you know, sight reading, ear training, um, improvising. Um, so if if any of you haven't got the Slaniminski, <laughs> I can advocate it. But I haven't got any questions. It was very good. Thank you very much. I also would like to put in. Uh, I always try to look not f for certain like pianists thing, but uh, Bergonzi is a saxophonist, and this is th this is for saxophone mostly. I know a lot of uh, influential people like uh, Alan Holsward, guitarist, one of the m most favorite for me, and I know that Slonimsky was also the base for his. Uh, you know, uh, language of music, what, what he did, and uh, that's amazing how they are using this. I'd like just to add, to add that uh, I use, uh, I'm using <laughs> Slonimsky in my ear training classes. It's very, very effective.
and I have also an uh, article about it too in the internet. I, I wish that in some our schools it, it would be like it, it should start they should start to use this. Uh, maybe I will try to prepare some some material for this because I think this is really useful and it's really useful to start from much earlier age than we discovered this now. <laughs> Okay, and I would like to ask in general, uh, do you feel as a performer and as a teacher still being a big gap between modern music and performer or is it getting better situation? What do you think and what are the main reasons for that? I think uh, this is a big gap and really? uh, of course uh, we need to set uh, about which group of, uh, of students or pupils we, we are talking but uh, in something like a conservatory uh, I think this is a big gap because uh, everything ends in 1915 or something like and then everything after is you know terra incognita and uh, something was happening with what is this and uh, I think this is also a question of, of competence of uh, teachers uh, maybe it's too risky to to get into this and maybe it's much more convenient to play all the good uh, classical repertoire and, and what they know themselves and uh, but uh, I tried my example to always to introduce much more uh, contemporary music. My, my uh, recent work was 13 Ligeti Etudes uh, and uh, I tried to do some like mini tour and the reception of the audience is, is really good. That's a surprise for me because I was worrying that you know nobody will understand. Of course I need a lot of verbal things. I need to explain this music uh, about uh, every attitude, uh, what what they can expect to hear, because of course this this would be much more uh, difficult if you just go and play and without an explanation. So this is much. This is the most important thing, and then we can move on with this. I think. Just as an observation, perhaps uh, what you're saying is to include in the repertoire a student uh, pieces that are from uh, different uh, periods that would include modern music. Um, and I would stretch that further and also I, I'm a trained church organist so a classical organ is the worst in this field. <clears throat> uh, if we had given literature that was broader very in the very, very beginning as a student, that I think would broaden our sensibility. But over and above the repertoire given as a, a, from a teacher to a student, I think the biggest thing that a teacher can teach the student is uh, when you get your degree, you're not done. That there is still so, so, so much more to learn. That you don't reach a point and you have it. You really never have anything except a desire to learn more. Here's uh, another observation. <clears throat> uh, thinking about the situation back in Belgrade, uh, typically instrumentalists are stuck in the 19th century. You know, pianists usually, you can make a list about 10 composers which are, you know, the beginning and, and the end of their repertory. Now, uh, currently I don't teach instrumentalists undergraduate, I'm, I'm talking about that level. However, uh, when I get to doctoral stu studies, I have something like a course, um, sort of somewhat analytical course for instrumentalists who are doctoral students. You ask them what they want to play, each and every one of them nowadays answers that they are very much interested in, in modern music, in, in what is right. They want to play pieces by their colleague composers who are, let's say, doctoral students or are about to enroll or have just finished. Uh, and that's a 
tremendously different from the time when I was a student. Uh, so they're, you know, different friends. Uh, one is uh, undergraduate teaching, the other is their interest. Sometimes it sounds a bit contradictory. Have you noticed something like that in, in your school? I would like to do like a common comment uh, for you both uh, that, uh, you know, I think what restricts or why it doesn't work with modern music is uh, uh, competitions. Because, uh, you know, I can, I can always uh, say like, let's try with, with this piece or with this. Oh, but, you know, where I will use this? Because I need to play the Chopin list, I need this for the concert, this and that. And a lot of music uh, goes just to the, you know, some, some goes out and with, without any attention. And uh, of course, and this is also a big problem with our, like a smaller country and culture, Lithuanian piano music, because, uh, you know, who will play some big sonata of some good modern composer of Lithuania instead that you can, you know, learn some Brahms third or Chopin third and you can use this much more broader than, uh, than this one. And this is a big problem that there is no, uh, no proper presentation of, of, of the music what we have. So this is not like a contemporary music suffers, the, the culture suffers, you know, from spreading and uh, and uh, I was writing this in my in my uh, dissertation about this problem because uh, this is like a, some canon and uh, and you must fit to it and uh, there is a lot of things and, and, and the, the, mo the biggest uh, factor and the player in this game is uh, competitions. And they play the same pieces, you know, and this is some like canonic repertoire. And uh, I also noticed that in our com competitions, uh, Lithuanian competitions, not some of some uh, Lithuanian composers, in the name of Lithuanian composer, they're reducing the requi requirements how many pieces to play uh, because of some foreign uh, pianists that they will. There is no purpose where to use this music for them, so so we must attract them. So let's reduce it. <laughs> so this is this is you know the big problem with the representation. Yeah, I um, I recently talked to my friend who's also a pianist, a teacher pianist, and and uh, I was just uh, serving and asking her how much she needs, uh, how much time she needs to prepare a uh, to prepare a recital of contemporary music, and um, and I was just questioning uh, the number of rehearsals and because uh, pianists nowadays, especially um, traditionally trained musicians in general. Uh, they need uh, additional time for contemporary music um, because she would say because of a fear of unknown and of totally different language they feel are actually having to decode when they're working on this. So it, she, t she needs quite a lot of less time to work on a completely new piece of list she never played before. Um, and whereas um, new contemporary piece would take a lot of time, even if it's much easier to play, but just to decode and uh, understand the language from the score in her, uh, to, to be able to transfer the, the notation in her head, apparently. And it got me wondering because um, um, luckily the things are changing and um, the, the new uh, performers are more open to new music. But it seems like they do have this uh, obstacle and barrier in understanding, and, and logically it is because of the decades of classical training and so much of classical training that they feel that is the only right way to, to interpret and decode music. And then they have not exercised um, the interpreting anything else. So I was thinking it would be actually quite amazing if, if from the early ages on they would, uh, the little kids would also get to 
be free and try and interpret the Cornelius treatise or anything like that. I mean, it would, it would just give the idea from the early age on that um, the interpretation of music is open. And yes, we do have a huge classical heritage we, we do need to go through, but there's also so many other worlds that we also need to be able to, yeah. to be open to and read. Do you think that would probably work? <laughs> Yes, it it would work, but we need to change a, a lot, you know, also this is a competence of teachers, what they said. Also, we need to change some elementary books, everything, and I hope that it will be. Uh, and I can also explain in my example, for example, now I, I was working on these two books of Ligeti, so I started in May, and and uh, and, I, and my concert was in last month, in, at the end. So all summer, what I saw was the keyboard. You know, there was no holiday, and uh, <laughs> and also in in comparison, I was teaching, uh, I was learning uh, this uh, number three blocked keys. It's just one minute forty seconds, and uh, the same time I was learning uh, Brahms the third sonata. So I learned that sonata. I was playing and I was still doing things with this one minute forty. <laughs> so this is the comparison, you know how much time you, you, you need to spend. But of course, if you're doing this, it also requires you less in, in some time. So, so you, you must keep up and do this. But of course, this is much more what you need to practice. <laughs>